Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, holy, merciful Father who loves us, we departed far from you in our sins, but you had compassion on us. When we did not know you, you loved us first. In order to save us, you sent your only begotten Son to be crucified and, and die on our behalf to receive the judgment and the curse that we ought to have received. And through the precious blood spilt by Jesus Christ, you cleansed our spirits eternally so that no longer would we be, would we be under the judgment of, for our sin. And For this great grace, we give you thanks. Lord, without any righteousness of our own, you saved us and have made us your holy children and have given us that glorious hope to enter into the eternal heaven. And for this great grace, we return all the thanks, praise, honor, and glory that is due you. Lord, uh, for the past um, summer retreat, we had seven rounds of it, and you have been with us. Many new souls have understood your grace. We thank you for that. Through your precious blood, we who have been saved uh, desire to live the rest of our lives acceptably before you as your children. And we ask that you would energize us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, and you'd uphold us with your right hand. And at this time, we who have been gathered uh, to listen to your word and to learn your word, we give you thanks for this opportunity for the churches nationally and internationally. There are many who are keeping their faiths in difficult situations. For all those br brothers and sisters, please work through us, through your Holy Spirit, that all your great holy will might be done through us. And even at this time, the words that you desire for us to understand, even at this time, your holy will, please help us to know how we ought to walk we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have the praise.
Let's take a look at the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'll read. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Just up to verse 9. As born again Christians, the most important thing we need to do is to preach the gospel to the many lost souls who do not yet know the gospel that they might be saved. And we are always diligently doing that work every moment of our lives. But there is a time when all the churches gather uh, across the country, while others of the world uh, spend uh, their summer vacations going to a uh, relaxing place, a refreshing place. It's a season for that for them. But for us, we gather at the retreat center, we preach the gospel, and we do the work of trying to save lost souls. We had this great opportunity this year as well. When born again Christians regard lost souls as more important than the, the whole world, and, and when we understand God's heart who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, even for the sake of one more person being saved, we pray together, we unite, we work, we sacrifice. This, uh, this opportunity was that important opportunity for us. Uh, of course, the coronavirus a pandemic is not yet over, but... Uh, we were able to gather together and have uh, seven stages, seven rounds of our summer retreat without much difficulty, and we were able to finish it. And of course, uh, many people uh, got newly saved through the retreat, and we saw many people rejoicing and being thankful in the Lord. <clears throat> Um, you know, all, a lot of brothers and sisters were praying much for the summer retreat and working hard and striving for the sake of the gospel. I want to first give my deepest uh, gratitude to you and also uh, very want to, you know, thank first and foremost our Heavenly Father who allowed uh, this opportunity to take place. Not only the pastors in front who are preaching the gospel, but uh, there were counseling, counseling pastors and uh, evangelists. And uh, all the mothers group members who were preparing uh, food um, and all those who were cleaning and taking care of the parking lot situations and, uh, and you know, serving in the choir and in all those who served and worked together. I believe all this was for God's, to God's glory and his uh, pleasure. You know, and even our prayers and strivings were not in vain. I think many people were saved through this retreat, these retreats. And although we cannot know the exact number, those who are saved themselves know, and of course God knows. And because you might be curious, I want to give you some of the results of our seven rounds of um, so the, the total summarization, summary of our retreats uh, and uh, retreats and, and the numbers around them. So total attendees we had throughout the seven retreats is 63,194 uh, attendees. And of course, you know, because of the pandemic, Uh, 
we were worried that there might uh, we we might not have um we might have to uh be, we might we might spread the, the the virus so many people were very careful and went through all the procedures and because of these things i think more people could have attended but um not to the full amount that we could have uh could have attended did attend and yet we still had 63,000 attendees which i think is is quite a lot furthermore those who have received counseling were 13,874 people. Those who are baptized, 5,899. And uh, the cars that were parked, we had 11,109 cars throughout the retreats that were uh, parked at our retreat center. And during the retreat, um, summer retreats, for the sake of uh, the construction, continued construction of the retreat center, uh, it's not there's not the exact number, but about maybe 459 million won uh, were donated for for that purpose, and we are really thankful for that. You know, last time, we had about 13 acres on the side of our retreat center that we bought and we um, you know, in, increased our parking lot capacity and we also built a new dormitory. And right now we're in the, uh, we're in the blueprinting and planning stages of it. Right now, of course, we are lacking in, in dormitories and that's why even a lot of the... Um, Hotels and places around our retreat centers are filled to the capacity whenever we have retreats. And so, you know, when we build more dormitories, we can have more people who can freely and easily um, listen to the the word and be saved. So we're, you know, in the process of planning this expansion. Uh, but we are planning to really make it a, quite a big dormitory, a really big one. And so we're in the plan process of planning it. But you know, as you know, uh, the construction costs have increased, and uh, you know, we were thinking, we we're asking, how much more do we have to give? And the elders. Uh, thought probably about 50 billion one <laughs> 50 billion one uh, but don't worry because our father is rich and also you know as born in saints we've done greater things than this before in the whole world about 80 plus countries even countries that are just outside of our uh, outside of korea there are about 906 churches but Probably more, more than a thousand that aren't that you know that we don't have named officially. You know, all of uh, our our overseas ministry, uh, as you know, most of our uh, evan evangelism is being done in poorer countries, because as you know, um, God promised that the poor are blessed and they will inherit the kingdom of heaven, and so. Uh, the poor have the gospel pre preached to them, and many evangelists and pastors are striving for the gospel overseas. And as a as a church, we are we're continuously uh, supplying the needs of those evangelists and pastors overseas, and uh, that comes with the sacrifice, your sacrifice, the sacrifice of our brothers and sisters. And I, without that, it's not possible. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Talking about the more we sacrifice, the more uh, people will be saved. And, but the more we are selfish and the more we are individualistic people and the less sacrifice there is, then there will be less, a sparing reap, um, or a sparing number of being saved, sparingly. Right? Uh, we know that the end is near and uh, there's not much opportunity for us to preach the gospel. So 
in these last moments uh, of preaching the gospel, we need to do the very utmost that we can uh, to preach the gospel. That's uh, that's my earnest heart and our desire. And of course, not just bes- besides us, there are other churches that are preaching the gospel across the world, I'm sure. But no matter how much we look carefully, uh, that work is uh, not very serious, and it doesn't seem like there is much being done to preach the gospel uh, amongst other other churches. Uh, but we know that as we preach the gospel, uh, and many people bring saved, the Holy Spirit is working through us, It's I think it's more and more difficult to find churches that like us. But I think that God is giving us an opportunity to preach the gospel in these end times. He's opening the door of the gospel. And as wh- and while that door is opened, let's do the best that we can, the utmost, to the utmost of our ability, so that many people can be saved. Uh, that's our earnest heart. And if we are if we are not up to the task, then we are going to be reprimanded by the Lord and we'll be uh, eternally regretful of the lack of effort that we put in. So uh, in these last opportunities, let's do the best we can. Let's preach the gospel without regret. And before the glory of the Lord who will return, let's let's seek that reward that comes. Um, and also because many people were saved at this past these past retreats, um, after you're saved, immediately after you're saved, uh, along with the saints that are already saved, we have fellowship in this fellowship called the church. In Philippians five six it says uh, that. God is faithful who called us into this fellowship in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 9. Uh, we were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God saved us. And He causes us to be a partaker of the fellowship, to partake in the fellowship. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, our fellowship is with our Lord Jesus Christ. And with us, a fellowship is talking about, you know, not just being alone after we're saved, but with the many brothers and sisters who were saved beforehand, the saints. We know that God that God works amongst us. The Holy Spirit dwells amongst us, and we are fulfilling the fellowship together. Right? And the fellowship we call this the church. You cannot be a church by yourself. But when the gathering of born-again saints are separated from the world for the sake of going into heaven and also for the sake of God's glory, we become the church. The fact that I am a part of this is something I need to realize. You know, when a baby is born, um, the mother and the father, as well as uh, older sisters, older brothers, cousins, um, aunts, uncles, there's a family, right? In the family. The baby grows and matures. Likewise, when we are saved, we are not saved by ourselves, but through the prayers and the strivings and sacrifices of the previously born again brothers and sisters, we have become saved. And also, our faith matures. And there in the church, we live the rest of our life for the Lord. And we are going to live with each other forever in heaven. So we also need to live with each other while we're here on the earth. You know, a few days ago, maybe about 20 years ago, I remember someone was saved through my evangelism, and he didn't come out to church. And he he went to another church that didn't have salvation. And I'm not sure if that person, if he was really saved or not, even though it's been such a long time. Because first and foremost, born-again Christians recognize other born-again Christians. Because we have one Heavenly Father, we are one, um, we are one family in Christ, we have the same hope in eternal heaven. 
Our purpose is now the same. So, you know, we can't do it alone, but as we have fellowship together, as we grow and mature in faith, and as we live for God's will and glory, and as we continue to preach the gospel, and other people are also newly born again, that is Christian life in the church. If you're not in the fellowship, if you're not abiding in the fellowship, it's difficult. It's, imp- it's hard to tell if that person is saved or not. That's why through our love for the brethren, we know that we have passed from death to life. He who does not love his brother abides in death, as it says in 1 John three fourteen. And of course, loving means you can't do it by yourself. But as we, born-again Christians, with the same life and hope, have the same heart, unite, this is love, loving each other. And that love is the evidence that we have passed from death to life. And so, born-again Christians, we live the rest of our lives together. We obey together, and we live for God's glory and will together. And until and when the Lord returns, then we can return. We can go to heaven with the Lord together, and live with each other forever together. So that's uh, my hope and desire that you would know. So for those who are newly born again, I would I wanted to preach uh, some words that are going to be helpful for those who are newly saved. But when we think about our salvation, of course, it is obvious, it's easy, right? If, if it was difficult to be saved, then who could be saved? If only those who are intelligent could be saved, then that would be very unfair. Or if you had to strive and put in some kind of effort, then it would be difficult uh, to be saved. Perhaps no one would be saved if that were the case. We drink. Uh, We breathe the air that the the Lord gives us. Through God's grace, we are living and we have life. And salvation itself is also freely given to us. When we think about it, obviously, it's easy, it's simple. And yet, we don't understand really how amazing our salvation is. You know, the air that we don't see, if that didn't exist, we would die immediately. If you don't breathe for 10 minutes, do you know what happens? God gave us this air that we breathe freely. We we breathe of it and we live because of it. And likewise, if we just open our hearts and receive the gospel in faith, that's salvation. And also Christian life is not difficult. It's easy, but it's also difficult. It's difficult, but it's also easy. But as we take one step at a time, from the very simplest things, we're going to learn first. You know, uh, you, you don't teach a, a, a child, um, you know, the, the, the kind of things that uh, professors in college study, right? You first get them through kindergarten, then elementary school, then, you know, so on and so forth. And they grow in their understanding of the world and knowledge. And likewise, in our faith, as we grow in faith, as it says in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First, we realize that God is living through the Word. Then we realize we have spirits, that we are sinners, that we are standing before the judgment seat when we die in our sin. Then we understand God's love and the grace that he has bestowed upon us. And you know, to know assuredly is also a part of believing assuredly. In John 17, 3, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life, salvation is the same thing. To have eternal life, you must first know God. And you must know Jesus Christ, whom God had sent in order to save us. 
to know and to believe is the same. Why are there those who cannot believe cannot believe because they don't know? And also when we are saved, we understand God's grace and we become saved. And after we're saved, our knowledge and, and of God and, and Jesus Christ and grace grows. We grow in grace. We understand that God saved us from our sin. But how, how amazing that grace is. How much He loves us. You know, we've only discovered a little bit of God's love, and yet we were saved. But in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, 19, it says, What is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God? You know, God's love, how great is it? How wide? It is wider than the Pacific Ocean. It is higher than the sun, deeper than the ocean. The love of my Lord. It's uh, lyrics from a, you know, a, a you know, little children's song that they sing in church. But we come to understand more and more of God's love as we mature. We understand that the love of God is so wide that it encompass, encompasses everyone in the world. And it is so high its length is so high that God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, came down to this lowly world uh, to save man. And it's and the love of God is so deep that even the lost sinners who are going to hell can be saved by uh, the love of God. And the height of God's love is so great that it leads us to eternal heaven. So we need to know more and more of God's love. Why do we have to be diligent in studying God's word? Because the more we study, the more we know God, the more we can come to know God. So that means in my heart, the love, joy, thankfulness, and God's grace starts to fill my heart more and more. So last Sunday, do you remember the topic? Sorry, not last week. Not last weekend, but uh, last weekend I was at the retreat center. And so, you know, for the past two months, I didn't give too many sermons on Sunday. Uh, but the last time I spoke, it was on Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. So great a salvation. With this being the focus of, of that sermon, we talked about the, the title of the sermon was The Greatest Gift God Has Given Man. And that's the same topic for today, the greatest gift that God has given us. You know, if you receive a really big gift, you are overcome with joy and thankfulness, right? And of course, gifts are given for free, right? You give a gift for free. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, to the praise and glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. The reason why God gave us this gift for free is because no one can pay the actual value of this gift. Because it is so valuable and so pricey, so high, that's why God could do nothing but give it to us for free as a gift. That gift of salvation, how great and amazing it is. Uh, we I want to talk a little bit about that today in our sermon. You know, we are sa- we might be saved, but we might not understand how amazing, how great our sal- uh, salvation really is. And I think many people are in that boat. So, this great gift that we have received, you know, we have received this gift, but it might be possible we don't understand the true value of it. We might think, oh, you know, uh, I think it's 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 nice. Um, maybe maybe it's um maybe it's a thousand dollars worth but then someone else might come to you and say that gift it's it's a million dollars and you you'd be shocked right so people say you can't even buy that with 10 million (laughs) dollars and now because of the economy nowadays it's a hundred million (laughs) dollars you'd be shocked right
you know, this gift that we have received, it is such an amazing gift, but we only understand a little bit of it, right? We understand a little bit of God's love. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us. When love shines in, when love shines in, how my heart is tuned to singing when love shines in. When joy and peace to others bringing, when love shines in. That love that shines in. That love that shines in, you know, love, a, a child might understand that his mother loves him, but how much? Maybe not much. And we might understand God's love, but we don't understand the depth and the height and the, the greatness of it. We don't know how big that love is, how great that love is. That's why Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, if you neglect so great a salvation, don't say so great a salvation, but it's so great a salvation. How can we express this with words? If you neglect so great a salvation, right? To neglect is to not understand the value, is to look down on it, to say, oh, what kind of salvation is this? You know, some people say, you know, don't give me salvation. Give me something that I can feel with my hands. And they look down on salvation. And people say, oh, I, you know, I can get salvation anytime I want to. I'll receive it later in my life, at the end of my life. Or, you know, some people go to the mall and, you know, they wear different clothes and try on different things. And then later at the end, I'll buy it next time. <laughs> Even though they've touched everything in the whole department store. Of course, sure, you could buy it next time. Sure. Of course, that is true for possessions. Of course, you go to the mall whenever you want and buy things if you have the money. But salvation is not an opportunity that's always given. Isaiah 55, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while you, he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There are some people who try to find God in the mountains praying at night, and they'll instead meet demons. But do you meet God when you go diligently to church? No. Where do you meet God? You meet God in his word. Through his word, God reveals himself. And through his word, we understand God's grace. That's when we meet God. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right? How can we seek and how can we find God except through his word? And so as we learn more of God's word, we come to know more of God. And we become, we become more close and personal and intimate in our relationship with the Lord. You know, even people, you know, who are we most... Uh, who are we most closest to? The person that we know the best, right? Whether it's your parents or whether it's your, your spouse or whether it's your brothers or si brother or sister, whether it's your friend. It's who you know the most that you are closest to. But how close are you to God? How much do you know of God? You know Him, but you might Think of him as a far away person. You just come to church on Sundays and you think about it a little bit while you're singing and while you're learning the word, but he's far. You think he's far, but that's not true. He resides within us, in our heart, and yet we are unaware. Some people are unaware. You know, they seem like it seems like true and we're learning the word, but it doesn't seem true and we're in our own lives. What does it mean to neglect so great a salvation? It means a sin of not believing in God's grace. Even though you hear it, you don't believe it. That's to neglect it. In Hebrews chapter 13, chapter 12, there was a man named Esau, right? He sold his birthright for a morsel of food. And the Bible calls him a profane person. You know, the birthright is the, the privilege to receive all of his father's possessions, but also it was blessed by God. And yet, because he was hungry at the moment, 
he sold his birthright for just a a, a bowl of stew. You know, I'm I'm dying of hunger right now. Why don't we? What is this birthright worth to me? And he exchanged it with Jacob. And that's why Esau he neglected, he disregarded, he looked lightly upon his birthright, right? And later, that is after he was got it stolen from him from Jacob. After later, he could not get it back, even though he cried and wept with tears. He could never re- receive it again. He lost that opportunity forever. Later, he was weeping over his birthright, wanting it back, but too bad it's stolen from him already. And yet there are people who listen to the word again and again and again, and they think, oh, yeah, I'll believe next time. I'll believe in Jesus next time. But those people, what will happen? We also need to repent. Are we like this kind of person? And there are some Christians who say, oh, that's, that's salvation, great, and look down on it. That's why in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? People say they believe. But is your faith the real deal? Is it a faith that is acknowledged by God? Examine yourself. Test yourself. You know, when you go to get a uh, you know a health checkup, you go get it often, right? Because of the coronavirus, um, you 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 check yourself at home, you test yourself at home, you test yourself at the testing centers because just in case, you know, just in case maybe you caught COVID while you didn't know, or perhaps you caught some other big disease and you didn't know. That's why we get examined often. But how about the Bible says examine your faith in the Bible. There is shipwrecked faith, vain faith, abandoned faith, dead faith. These kinds of faiths that are not acknowledged by God. They are fake. They are false. Because that's the kind of faith that the devil plants in people. And they think, oh yeah, I guess I'm a believer. I guess I believe. And, and they think, oh, I can just believe however I want to, live my Christian life. Uh, just kind of, uh, you know, however I want to and, and just live my life. Is that really faith? And so, we need to even examine our own faith through the Word. How are we going to examine our faith? Am I going to ask somebody, you know, you know, how is my faith life? Or, you know, am I saved? You have to, you know, it'd be nice if you could have an x-ray that just shot through your spirit to see whether you're saved or not. But you need to examine yourself through the Word. Test yourself through the Word. Because that's what we believe. We believe in the Word. Do I believe according to the Word? If I do, then that's salvation. But if my faith is not on the word and I believe in my own self, if I believe that I was saved when I prayed up in a mountain or when some spiritual person said to me that I was saved, I believe that to be the basis of my uh, salvation, then that's then you're not saved. Through the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Because when we understand the word and believe in it, that's faith. And those who have been saved through the word of God, through faith, must continue to live in faith. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, right? From uh, faith, self, saving faith to now growing faith, obedient faith, to a faith that does works, right? There is the progression of faith in our lives. Our faith grows. In Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, your faith grows exceedingly. Our faith must grow because it has life. Life causes it to grow. It must change. Our hearts change. Our lives change. And even those who have lived a dark past become changed and brightened to live for God's glory and will. That is what it means to grow in the faith, right? That change in your life. That must happen in your life. That is to say, the the sin of neglecting this great salvation is a great sin. You know, there is no other sin that can 
that cannot be forgiven because the blood of Jesus Christ forgives the sins of all mankind, all the world, for all time, forever. That's an amazing thing. That he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? The sin of all the people of the world. That is including my sin, you know, my sins and your sins and all of our sins. As the hymn goes, God who, t- Jesus who took all our sins, bored upon himself. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, right? Propitiations means, you know, we were enemies with God because of our sin. Because God is holy, he cannot accept sinners. Because of sin, we have become enemies with God. And yet, we who have become enemies, Jesus Christ came and stood in our place, receiving the judgment and the curse that we ought to have received and died on our behalf. He who had no sin received God's punishment and wrath and judgment died on our behalf, the judgment that we ought to receive as sinners. Because without the spilling of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, right? But God's holy son, the the only son of, of God, came down and shed all of his blood on the cross for us as our propitiation. And that sin of not believing on the blood of Christ, that sin of not believing in God's grace, there is no, uh, there is nothing to do for someone who doesn't believe that, doesn't believe in his blood, doesn't believe in God's grace. That's why in John chapter 3 verse 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. Why are you not condemned if you believe in Jesus? Because Jesus bore our condemnation. He bore our curse and sin. The judgment and the wrath and the judgment that we should have received, Jesus received on our behalf on the cross. That's the judgment that I should receive, the cross. But he bore for me. So he who believes in him is not condemned. Right? We are for, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord bore upon his body the punishment for our sin. The sins that I committed with my body, Jesus paid for it with his body. But the sin of not believing in Jesus' grace, that grace, is the sin of unbelief. There is no forgiveness for unbelief. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? The sin of breaking the law cannot be forgiven, uh, was not forgiven. Instead, people were stoned for breaking that law. But now, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, if we count it a common thing and we trample on that blood of Jesus Christ, when people say, oh, how does Jesus' blood clean me, cleanse me? I don't believe it. This hymn goes, for cleansing in thy precious blood, right? Cleansing. And though Jesus' blood continues to clean and clean and clean, it never becomes dirty itself, right? I hear thy welcome voice that calls me Lord to thee, for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary, and yet people trample on the blood of Jesus Christ. People say, oh, blood is disgusting. I don't want to keep talking about blood in church. What's that all about? That blood that sanctifies. Through the blood, you know, God promised to pass over our judgment. That promise, that covenant. And yet to trample on the Son of God underfoot that and count his blood as a common thing. Right? And you know, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps to understand God's grace and, and uh, the gospel and salvation. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify of all things to the end of the world. Right? When he has come, he will uh, tell you all things. And the Holy Spirit comes and teaches us what Jesus Christ has done and helps us to believe. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, 
we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Who is the one who helps to understand the things given to us freely? The graces of God? That is the Holy Spirit. Right? God is one who, from the beginning, God the Father planned all things. God the Son fulfilled the plan of salvation. And the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, helps us to understand the, the grace of salvation and be saved. And yet, you are cursing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of grace, insulting the Spirit of grace when we count the blood as common. When we, when we neglect that greatest salvation, there is no escape. There is no forgiveness. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Right? In other words, the sin of unbelief. There is no way to flee the judgment if you do not believe. No matter if you're, you know, successful in this world, have done great things, you know, uh, for philanthropy, for country, and, you know, gave your life for that, for, for things of the world. Can that save your spirit? Does that have any bearing at all to your spiritual status? You know, sometimes when I look at people who are, you know, just amazing, you know, people who are very amazing, very kind, and, and, you know, very philanthropic, but they don't believe in Jesus. They don't know God's grace. And sometimes I think this way, you know, if, if, I, were gra- if I were God, I would save this person especially. But, you know, you can get special admission to college, sure. But there is no special admission to heaven. There is only the blood of Christ as the only way of admission. Only the blood of Christ saves us. My eternal testimony, the blood of Christ. There is only the blood of Christ for sinners to get to heaven. No other way. And that's why in John chapter 3, verse 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Right? Those who believe in the Son have everlasting life. Those who do not believe in the Son do not see life. And instead, the wrath of God abides in them. And those who believe in God's word and, and have saving faith in him will see to have eternal life. But those who do not believe the Son, that is to say, those who are disobedient to the faith, that is to say that you know, not believing is the greatest disobedience. You know, Adam, he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did he eat of it? Even though God commanded him not to. You know, is it because Eve ate first and he Eve gave it to her, so he felt compelled to? No, it doesn't matter if Eve gave it to him or some other person gave it to him. If you realize that God said you will eat the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, he wouldn't eat of it. But the devil says, eat of it. You won't die. You'll be like God. And that's why he's afraid. That's why I told you not to eat of it. You'll be wise. It's good for food. Eat it. And that's why Eve doubted God's word. If they had faith in God's word, then of course they wouldn't eat, it, eat of it. If, if it cost them their life, they wouldn't have eat of it. But th- do you know that unbelief is the beginning of disobedience and sin? So to believe in what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and forgiving us of our sin, that is the greatest obedience. But to not believe is the greatest disobedience. So he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. To not see life means to not have eternal life. Right? If you don't see life, do you think you'll have eternal life? No. But instead, the wrath of God abides on him. Imagine if there was a very sharp knife that's following you wherever you're going, right? on top of your head, following you. And even while you're sleeping, it could, just, it could just fall on you. That's what it means when the wrath of God abides on him. It's a scary expression. It's fearful. And yet people believe, they listen to the whole thing and they say, oh, I'll believe next time. I'm sorry, but that means that you, you have no right to listen and to believe in this.
That's why in Isaiah 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Those who are spiritually thirsty and hungry, God promises to give them living waters. That's God's invitation. Come. In Isaiah 55, verse 3, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. Right? Come and listen. Hear, and you shall live. And yet people don't listen. And while they listen, are they listening or are they sleeping? Who knows? Do you really think the Word of God will enter your heart with that kind of attitude? Now, some people say like this, you know, if this cup, you know, there was a man on death row and he he commanded, he was begging the king, please let me live. And so the king said, okay, here have, you have this cup of water and I'll give you a lid. Um, if any, if even one drop of water falls from this cup, you will die and you have to walk around the whole island. If you come, if you walk around the whole island and come back here, then I will forgive you and you can be free from your death penalty. What do you think this, this inmate would do? Right? He would hold it very carefully. Because if he, if he just you know, tilts a little bit, he'll die, right? If he hears some people laughing, will he go over there and see what's happening? Or if he hears some, something interesting, will he go there and watch? No, because the moment that a drop of water drops, he'll die, right? This is a matter of life and death. He'll be very careful and carefully go across, um, not the island, but the castle, right? Go around the castle to, to come back. That's the kind of attitude we need to listen to the word if we want to be saved. And yet some people don't even care what's being said. And they think, oh, I guess I'll listen to it next time. And of course, sure, you'll listen to it again and again and again. And hopefully, maybe you'll come to your senses. senses. And yet... Unless you have that heart that really cries out as if you're from the bottom of hell, crying out for salvation, it's hard for anyone uh, to listen with the mind to be saved. That's why in Matthew, it talks about, um, the Gospel of Matthew talks about a parable where a king invited uh, guests for a wedding feast. And first he sent an invitation letters, right? And when the day arrived, uh, he sent his servants to personally uh, come. I invite them. But some people said, oh, you know, I have, I don't know, the king prepared a fatted calf and everything was made ready. But people didn't want to come. So the king sent more more of his servants, more of his servants, but they refused. Oh, you know, I bought a field and I got to go test it. So what about the field? Is someone going to steal your field? Oh, you know, I bought five oxen. I have to test them. You You tested them when you first bought them. Don't lie. Oh, you know, I got married. I'm sorry, I can't go. And you know, I guess that makes sense a little bit, but this is the king's wedding feast, right? It's not a regular wedding. It's not a regular feast or a party. It's the king, from the king. Special invitation. And and the king sent more servants, but now, you know, these people are getting angry. You know, I told you I'm not going to go. And so they killed the servants. How could this be? So do you remember what the king did in that parable? In Matthew 22, it's, if you read it, it's interesting. The king, in his anger, sent his army and killed those people and burned their houses. Isn't that scary? The king invited them to a party, a feast. Not only did they reject the invitation, but they killed the servants of the king. Of course, that makes sense. So he destroyed uh, them and their property and everything. And now the feast was ready, but those who were first uh, uh, invited were not worthy. So go to the, the byways and the highways and invite everyone, good or evil, anyone. Fill my house. Fill my feast. 
you know, the people who first received the invitation were the Israel people. They rejected Jesus Christ. They killed Jesus Christ. They killed those who preached the gospel and chased them out. And so what did God do? God sent the Roman army, destroyed uh, Jerusalem, a million Jews in a day, and scared them across the world. The, the temple in Jerusalem was broken for 2,000 years because of what sin? Not because they didn't keep the law well, but because they rejected Jesus Christ. Throughout the, the whole world, they were, uh, the gospel was preached in the highways and the byways and even to us. Right, The gospel has come even to us. And those who refuse to listen to the gospel to the very end, we, sh- we point them to Israel. Look what happened to them who rejected God and Jesus Christ until the very end. In Jesus' words. This, if this is what happens in the green wood, what will happen in the dry? The green wood is talking about Israel. Because they are chosen people of God. But the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ caused them to die for 2,000 years and be persecuted for 2,000 years. But if dry tree, the dry wood, rejects Christ, what will happen? You know, God showed the example to the Israel people how great the sin of rejection is. The only thing waiting for those to reject of the dry wood is eternal hell. So, how scary is it when the Bible says, what will happen if we neglect so great a salvation? To insult the spirit of grace, to count the blood of Christ as a common thing, how great that punishment will be. The great, how great the salvation, depending on how great the salvation is, those who reject it will receive such an equally great judgment. And I talked about you know neglecting salvation. That is to continue. You know, we need to continuously hear these words again. But those who are born again might not understand how great this grace is, and because of that, they don't have thankfulness in their lives. You know, some people receive a gift, and they're excited about the gift, but then they just leave it behind. They don't even open it. They don't have any heart of thankfulness towards it, towards the giver. That amazing gift. That is a gift directly correlated to your life. Let's say that there was a medicine that could save your life in that gift. Or you had a great debt and in that gift, you know, someone sold their house and, and wanted to pay off your debt with that gift. Then you'd be so thankful. You'd be so overjoyed for that gift, right? You know, if, I, if it weren't for that person's grace, then what would I be doing right now? I would be dead. And yet, those who have been saved, who have been saved from the very depths of hell, and, G- and God sent Jesus Christ to spill all His blood on the cross and forgive us of our sins eternally, we say we believe it, and yet, they don't care. They're not thankful. Sure, the Lord died for me, but I don't I don't want to do anything for the Lord. Sorry, this is just how I feel. Really. You're saved, but you don't have a desire to live for the Lord. You don't have a heart to obey. Even those who are born again, because of our own selfishness and our own uh, greed for the world, it's possible, maybe, that our hearts can become like this, maybe. But if we really are saved, and if we neglect so great a salvation, that's a sin. That's a big sin. That's a grave sin. To look at our salvation lightly, is it really like that? You know, if we do, our, if we live our Christian life wrong, that we are neglecting the grace of God. Is really the blood of Christ something so light? Is really something so valueless that we treat it that way?
they don't have a heart to repay that grace or to live for the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The Lord died for us, that we no longer would we be judged for our own sin. We live through his life and his death, that we should no longer live for ourselves. You know, before we were saved, of course we lived for ourselves. We would live for how we could be more successful, have more, eat more, live better, right? And yet we're going to die. Uh, everyone's going to die. But now that we're saved, we realize, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to live for myself. In Romans chapter 14, verse 7 and 8, For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Who is this we, us? It's those who are truly saved. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. In living for the Lord, in dying for the Lord, in life or death, I am the Lord's. That's how the song goes. Of course, that's an obvious sentiment. Is that a special kind of heart that some people have? Now, if you were to die a hundred times for the Lord, that would not be enough to repay His grace, but at least we should live this one life for the Lord, right? And yet some people don't want to. In Romans chapter 14, in 7, 8, and 9, verse 9 says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, right? To this end, right? Whether we live or die by the Lord, it's that end. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. He is the Lord of our lives. And before we were saved, we were the Lord. You were the Lord of your life, the master of your life. But after we're saved, we realize, no, the Lord is the master of my life. He is the Lord of life. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If it's the will of the Lord, then I will live. If it's the Lord's will, then I will die. Whether we live or die, that's up to the Lord. Is that a, a special kind of heart? No, that's an obvious thing. If you look at someone who's living diligently for Christ, do you think, oh, that brother or sister, he's special or she's special. Is that really special? Is he special and are you just normal? That is the, the most normal kind of life, in fact. That's the most obvious way of living if we are saved. Because if you don't live that way, that's abnormal, in fact. Right? So that's why the sin of unbelief, the sin of uh, disobedience, I should say, that is to say the blood of Christ, the grace of the Lord, is to, is to, to neglect that, those things, is a great sin. Furthermore, the more we understand how great our salvation is, the more we also understand how important other people's salvation are as well. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Jesus says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will, man, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> Even if he gains the whole world and he loses his, his soul, right, his spirit, What will you give in exchange for your soul? We who have been created in the image of God, how important and precious we are in God's eyes. That's why God sent His only begotten Son to save us. Is there anyone that would 
get, pay a high price for worthless material? No. If someone sells all of his possessions to buy something, then we know how precious that thing is to them. If a son of a, of a, chi- of a parent becomes deadly sick, then if the family, if, if they could just heal the son, the sickness would sell everything to heal that son. Right? I've, I've seen this story actually in, in Mongolia. He had some white uh, blood cancer, uh, white blood cell cancer. I think it's sickle cell cancer. And um, you know, his father was a painter. His mother was a teacher, school teacher. And they had a daughter and a son. But the son, in order to save his sickness, uh, they moved from the countryside up to the city Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, the big city. And, you know, her mother quit. His mother quit working. His, his dad, his father quit working just so that the son could be healed. They moved their whole house. And um, they were connected to our church. They became saved. I remember visiting their house too, their family. And the son is lying down, but he's, you know, he's smiling, he's happy. And even though he's sitting down, he's make, lying down, I should say, he's making something with his hands. And his father was painting and, you know, put those paintings in the church bu- building and you know, beautiful paintings. The whole family, t- to save their son from sickness, uprooted themselves. You know, I was moved by that. And yet they were all saved, their whole family. They became saved, I should say. And now they don't care. They're not fearful of death. And how precious our soul is that God sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us. You know, the one thing that you have to understand is that even if there was no one in the world except for you alone, the Lord would come and die for our sin. Die for your sin. For each and every soul, each and every person, how precious we are in God's eyes, right? Do you not understand how important and precious we are? How great and precious is our salvation. If we understand this, then to my family, my relatives, my friends, even those who have no connection with me, for even one person to be saved, because in those people are the image of God that God created within them. And even for those, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Can we just sit around idly and do nothing? You know, there's nothing we could do if they refuse to, to accept. But is there anything, But do we just say, oh, well, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to tell them. But we have to do the very best to even save one more soul. You know, some brothers and sisters are amazing. When I look at them, I'm amazed. They don't. They sleep less and less, so that even one person could be saved. And they give all of their heart and their strength. They don't use any money for themselves, but they use money to preach the gospel f- abundantly out of their own pocket. And I look at those brothers and sisters, and I know. The love of God is in them. Their life is evidence. And yet, to not really care about the state of other souls, when we think, oh, if they don't want to be saved, then whatever. Too bad for you. That also is a way that we are neglecting so great a salvation. Apostle Paul In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, Apostle Paul said this, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If I don't preach the gospel, then woe am I, cursed am I. What kind of curse? What kind of woe? Not, not the curse of going to hell, but the woe. He is talking about, he says that I I became a slave. I became a servant to all men that by all means I might win some, right? He became a slave to men. 
right? Serving them, helping people. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. But can't we live that way as well? That's why when one person becomes saved, we get so we're so overjoyed. And if some people don't get saved, we're broken hearted. That's the heart of Christ. Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11 and 12. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each one, each man, according to his deeds? It says here, deliver those who are drawn toward death. Who are those who are drawn toward death? Those who are not saved are enslaved by the devil and are being dragged to hell. And the Bible says, deliver them. Deliver them. That is to intervene, interfere in that process and deliver them. That's not to say don't care about their, current, their spiritual state. Hold back those who are stumbling, those back stumbling to... Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Those who are drawn toward death, those who are stumbling to the slaughter, those who are going to hell, don't just leave them be. You know, the American president, with his power, can he save a spirit? No, no way. Can the top scientist of the world, with his uh, tools and, and, and technology, make a rocket to, to the moon, to Mars, and with that rocket, can he send a spirit to heaven? Can the richest man in the world, with all of his possessions, buy a soul? Can a doctor who could heal any disease heal sin? No, that's impossible. But we can. Think about it. How great of a privilege it is to be able to save others. Can the dead save the dead? No, but because we are living, Jesus said this, right? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you preach the gospel, right? The dead can bury their own dead. Leave it to them, whatever. But because you are living, you preach the gospel. We are living. The living should do the work of the living. Can the living hold on to the dead? You know, as Christians, this is our greatest mission and our purpose of living. And you know, in two weeks, we have our fall retreat, we have Bible seminar, we have to continuously preach the gospel. If you say, surely we do not know this, you know, that's to say, oh, you know, he's going to help, but you know, I'm busy with my own work. Does not he who weigh the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each one according to his deeds? According to what deeds? Whether you preach the gospel or not. To know, if you know to do good and don't do it, that is sin. You know, in the world, to do evil is, is, is sin, right? It's wrong. 
But to, for Christians, if you don't do good, that is sin. And the greatest good is to preach the gospel. That's the greatest priority. If we don't do that, that is to us a sin. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You might think, oh, I'm living a kind life. I'm, I'm minding my own business, but I don't care about you know, preaching the gospel. All the brothers and sisters are doing it well. But you know, I'll just, you know, I have my own situation and circumstance. Sorry, but I'm going to live my life and other people can preach the gospel for me. Really? How have you come before the Lord? Will that really, what will he say? If you really are saved, then you'll be rebuked by the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. It says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman over the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them a warning for me from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. You preach the gospel and they don't listen, then that person will die in his sin, in her sin. But we're not going to be responsible. If we preach the gospel, that is, and they don't accept, then that's on them. But if a watchman sees an army approaching the city, he has to make sure that the, the city is ready. If the enemy is coming, if he just watches without doing anything, doesn't blow the trumpet of warning, but instead blows the trumpet of peace, and people died because of his lack of action, then what about that that watchman? He is he is in big error, right? That's great error. We also are like that watchman, whether people listen or not, we need to blow the trumpet of warning. Whether they hear or whether they refuse, that's their that's their issue. But we have the responsibility of preaching the gospel. You know, if you read the book of, of D.L. Moody, if he didn't preach the gospel to someone in one day, you know, one, one day he forgot to preach the gospel to someone, so he woke up in the middle of the night, went outside, found someone under the, the street lamp, and he preached the gospel to him. He wrote, that was his life. And maybe we can't live in that way. But at the very least, shouldn't we preach the gospel? When the love's when the Lord's love, when we realize that love of the Lord, that's why Jeremiah said. But when he didn't preach the word of God, he felt like his heart was on fire, right? Shut up in his bones, he was weary of holding it back, and he could not. Those who have the gospel, who pre- want to preach the gospel, are saved. They have this burning desire to want to speak the truth. And how great if we all had this this passion for this mission. If one, if if people are saved one by one, you know, know, after Cain killed Abel, what did Cain say? God said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Cain said, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Really, you don't know. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What is the blood saying? The blood is saying, you know, God, my older brother killed me. But Cain said, not knowing this, he said, am I my brother's keeper? Even if you did not know, and even if we did not kill anyone, like Cain killed Abel, But if we see people stumbling to death, drawn toward uh, slaughter to death, and we don't say anything, then we are are partakers in, in that murder, right? In that death. You see people who are going to hell, but you you say you don't know, you don't care. People who are drowning in the water, you pass them, and if you could help them a little bit, they could be saved, but you just pass them by and don't care.
some people, you know, there, but there was some person who was drowning and he couldn't help, or he was dying, but some person didn't want to help, just went his way. What a, you, you, and that person, he, because he left that person, let him die. Whatever he passed by that area, he would hear the voice of that drowning person saying, you scum, how dare you not save me when you could have just helped me a little bit and I could have lived. You, you scum. Likewise, when we don't preach the gospel, that is also the sin of neglecting so great a salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we have been, for by grace you have been saved through faith. For by grace, when we understand and believe in that grace, you know, the Bible talks a lot about grace. But the forgiveness of sins, the salvation of our spirit, there is no greater grace. We have, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians is written to born-again saints in the church of Ephesus. He's saying, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You have been saved. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. This is the greatest gift that man, that God has given man, with the highest price being paid for the gift. Sending his only begotten son as the propitiation for our sin. God who created the universe with his word, with his power, he controls the universe and maintains it. But saving us, he could not do it with just his word and his power. Because God is the God of justice. The price, the wages of sin had to be paid. So God sent his only begotten son to pay the price. He died on the cross to pay the price. That is to say that he himself died for us. That's why in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it doesn't say that he purchased the church with the blood of Jesus. It says he purchased the church with his own blood. Because Jesus is God. And the blood of Jesus spilt is God's own blood. How high the price of salvation this is. Do you realize how great your salvation is? You know, and of course, I, even I don't understand how great it is. But as we learn the word more and more, we realize that it is a great salvation. To the point where our hearts will burst, brimming with thankfulness and, and joy, and not being able to hold ourselves back in preaching this truth. And that's where we live and we die for the Lord. That is our desire. That's, an, that's a natural, obvious thing. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. Let's read together. Which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God, God in truth. Which has come to you, it says, the gospel. The gospel started in Jerusalem and went westward and all the way around the world and came late uh, to the Eastern Hemisphere. About 2,000 years after the truth of Christ dying on the cross, the gospel has come to us, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world and is bringing fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the, the grace of God in truth. The day you hear and believe is the day you are saved. Amazing, amazing day when my sins were washed away. Or the song goes, happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. 
O happy bond that seals my vows to him who merits all my love. Happy day, happy day. We cannot forget that day. The day that you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, from that day, a new life has begun. Even at this this retreat, these retreats, many people were baptized. What is baptism? Baptism is what has been fulfilled in your heart uh, to confess it before God and man in a ceremony, the baptism ceremony. I've been I'm dead with Christ, I've been buried with him. The sinner has died, and the righteous man has the righteous has lived. I have died to myself and now I'm living for the Lord. The life for myself has been finished. It's I'm buried. And now a new life for the Lord has begun. So that's why baptism is actually a funeral. What do we bury? We bury the old man. This old man full of sin, full of our own thought, full of our own desires for the world has been buried. He's done for. And now it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. We begin a new life with the Lord. Behold, the old things have passed away and all things have become new. Of course, there must have been this day that you have been saved. Because since the day that you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. What, doing what? Was it doing since the day you heard and, uh, heard and knew the grace of God in truth? It is bringing forth fruit. So whether it's in the Ephesian church, the Corinthian church, the Col- Colossian church, Whatever church it goes, the gospel continues to preach, bring fruit. You know, as we after we're saved, we mature and grow, and we bear fruit. Beautiful fruit for the glory of God. You know, our, the change of our lives is uh, fruit, right? There are the nine. Uh, there's the nine uh, fruits of the spirit. We started learning about them, but we didn't finish in Galatians, right? The nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I think I have to keep t- teaching about that until we bear them in our lives, right? And of course, the the people who are uh, those who are born again through our preaching are also fruit. Just as a grape vine produces grapes, likewise Christians must produce more Christians. You know, nowadays, you know, people are unwilling to get uh, to have children. So, you know, first of all, most people, you know, a lot of people don't want to get married. And then there are people who get married, but then don't want to have children. They say, oh, you know, it's so hard to have a child, you know. You know, you have to, oh, man, this life is hard. There's no time to enjoy your own life. You know, oh, you have to, you know, spend all your time with the child and all your money for the child. And, you know, a long time ago, they used to say that a child used to come out with his own food to eat. But nowadays, you have to feed the child your, your food. And how much money it takes to pay, to pay for the child's education and everything else. Really? You know, now, it's hard for two new people to bring one person to, into the world. And instead, in fact, they say that there are two times more children that are killed in the womb than actually live, uh, live out the womb. We live in such a selfish world where the history of the world will end soon. The fruit of the womb is given by God. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. But some people say this. You know, if people aren't saved through us, then I guess we're going to have to uh, do some stomach exercises. (laughs) In other words, that is, you know, to have a lot of children, right? So, you know, some, some of our brothers and sisters have huge families and in fact that causes some churches to become really big actually i've seen that it's kind of funny but whether you know we have more children sure that's fine or you know preach the gospel so that other people are saved but either way we need to bear fruit in our lives 
You're sa- you say you're saved, but there's no fruit in your life. Or like in a famine, a, a tree might bring just one fruit to, to bear. How unfortunate is that, right? And yet we, we see all these people in the world going to hell. And we know what's going to happen. If you know this, then why aren't you doing anything about it? And we say, hey, I want to talk to you. Do you know where you're headed in life? No, we have things to say, right? Think about it. There's a message we need to bring to people. We want them to listen to the word. And, you know, for our fall retreat, you know, make plans to preach the gospel. Whether it's through the internet um, or through counseling, through the Bible seminar, there are many methods that we have. That is to say, let's not neglect so great a salvation, but let's have other people receive this great salvation and receive this gift of God. It's a, God, it's a gift that God desires to give everyone, and yet people don't know. But because they don't know, they go to hell. So we need to preach the gospel. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. The reason why Jesus came into this world is to save sinners. In other words, to take away our sin. In uh, John chapter 3, uh, chapter 1 verse 9, it's, uh, in the Gospel of John it says, you know, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is, your sin and my sin, the sin of the whole world. In Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus bore all of our iniquity, and he bore our judgment and because of his because he received the punishment we are saved that grace that so great salvation now even after you're saved think carefully about your own salvation how great it is that one man died for all and and think about how you are a part of the all that the holy god would come and die for a sinner like me personally With his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And even now, he's praying for me, making intercession for me uh, at the right hand of God the Father. How can we forget Christ? How can we forget and neglect so great a salvation? We must not forget. Not only our sin, but also for the whole world, right? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, when we didn't know God, when we didn't love God, it's not that we loved Him first, but He loved us first. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We who were enemies with God, He made peace with us and for us. That grace, how great is that grace? Can you forget that grace? Can you forget that grace? Even if you forget everything else, you cannot forget that grace. If you try to forget, then God will, you know, that's not me saying that. That's what God is saying. It's not, let's not forget. We cannot neglect so great a salvation. We must not forget what kind of grace we have received. Um, there was a lot more that I wanted to talk to you about today, but uh, let's take time. Let's take time to get through them. If I tell you all these things at once, then it's difficult for us to uh, meditate and to understand these things. So this great salvation, let's continuously think upon this great salvation and living for the Lord who lived and died for me. And there are things that I must do for the sake of this gospel. Let's not live our life so that God's grace is in vain. Let's pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, when we had been far from you, living in our sin, living for the vain things of the world, following after the lusts of our flesh, and we had become enemies through our evil works, yet you loved us. And our Lord Jesus Christ, 
bore upon himself the the uh, the judgment that we should have bore, and through his precious blood spilled, our all of our sins have been cleansed eternally, not with righteousness of our own, but only through your grace. For these graces we give you thanks, we who have been saved through your blood. Help us to live only for your will and glory. And for those who are not yet saved, for the many lost and poor souls around us, please help us to preach the gospel that your great work might be done. For all the Bible seminars that are happening across the world, and even for our planned retreat, um, retreats in the future, please help many people to be saved. Help us to figure out what we need to do for these, uh, for your uh, work to be done through us. Help us not to be lazy, but help us to live uh, being used for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.